Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Never done that before. Leadership is bringing together a group of people, diverse, different views, different places, but bringing them together around a common set of goals and working with them to achieve those goals. And that requires sacrifice on your part. It requires that ability to care about others before you care about yourself. I hope of the many things you take from your time here at Notre Dame, of the many things you learn. I hope you learn that. That simply is a theoretical concept, but as a commitment in your life. Because then you will take whatever skills you have, whatever abilities you have, and put them to a higher idea, make them even more powerful by enabling others to do great things with you. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your hard work. Congratulations on your coming to completion of this academic year. And uh, just know that each and every one of you is in my prayers and the prayers of all of us here at Notre Dame as you continue your studies in ROTC. God bless you all. Go Irish. We gather there as though lost in the middle of an immense forest, when across the woods we see the lamp that lights up the mean dwelling where our good master resides, we know full well that we are not alone. Jesus Christ dwells in our midst, and so we take courage. Father Edouard Sorin
I really am convinced and have been convinced since I walked into the doors of Misericordia South 50 some years ago that it's such a special place. I think the fact that I'm surrounded by wonderful people, including the staff and especially the residents, they're challenging, they're loving, they live life beautifully, and they can be models for us all. Sister Rosemary offers an invitation to families. The invitation comes, you open it up, and inside of it, it says, come and see. Look into the soul and life and character of our residents and the staff members who love and cherish and care for them. Find in there the person that God created them to be. She's, to me, the most charismatic woman you'll ever meet. She's kind and she's strong and she's compassionate, but at the same time, she's determined, uh, she's driven, and at times defiant. She knew that she wanted the best independent possible life she could give to these wonderful people that she was called to serve. And she made it happen. They're generally joyful people, beautiful people made by God with a purpose to their lives, no matter how wrapped in mystery their purpose may be. I think God sent Sister Rosemary here to be an angel for all of us. All my friends adore her because of the wonderful work that she does, because of the wonderful care that she gives. I think it's truly one of the best places on this, on this planet. And I'm truly, truly happy. My son, Andrew John Myers, was admitted to Misericordia in 2004. It was very difficult for my wife, Bonnie, and I to let go of him. Once he was admitted, my wife developed a glioblastoma, a brain tumor. Normally, one dies of that disease within a year. Fortunately, she lived three. But on her deathbed, she said to me, Bob, I'm so grateful that Andrew has been admitted to Misericordia in Sister Rosemary's care with the staff, because I now can die in peace knowing he has a home. Sister will be gone a thousand lifetimes, and they'll Sorry, I'm so connected. Um, she'll be remembered for a thousand lifetimes because she is, she is, um, she's been the spirit of Misericordia for a long time, and that is a lasting legacy. I always felt that God was with me, that God really um, took care of me. Uh, he always even spoiled me by always making the right people in the right place at the right time. Uh, I think that's been my secret. It enriches life so much when you're involved with something beyond yourself. It's just been a wonderful journey. Growing up in Colombia, I have never known a day without violence. For over 50 years, my country has been torn apart by civil war. And every citizen, not just the combatants, has been affected. When I was 14, I watched my father, a human rights lawyer, thrown into jail on false charges. Even after he was freed, we lived in a constant state of terror. The Colombian Civil War has claimed over 220,000 lives and displaced over 6 million people. In May of 2015, President Juan Manuel Santos appointed Notre Dame law professor Doug Castle to help negotiate a peace accord between the Colombian government and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. To achieve sustainable peace, we knew it was vital first to address the atrocities of the past, 
my work focused on negotiating a transitional justice system designed to ensure respect for the victims of war crimes on all sides of the conflict. Doug Castle's role was very important. He knows how far you have to go to respect the minimum conditions in today's world and at the same time allow a country in conflict to achieve peace. Peace is a process, and the reforms agreed to will take years to carry out. That's why at Notre Dame, we are so committed to educating lawyers like Nadi, who will work to make peace and justice a reality for generations to come. The University of Notre Dame asks, what would you fight for? Fighting for lasting peace. We are the Fighting Irish. We trust that the values you've learned here, the joy of truth, the exhilaration of beauty, the strength of goodness, the passion for justice, the quiet courage born of prayer, the love and compassion we owe our fellow human beings, the modesty and humility that our human frailty dictates to us, the inner dignity of all things truly human, even before they are born and not ending until they die. We trust that all of these intellectual and moral qualities will take deeper root in your lives, and that they will grow through you and in you in all the days ahead, to enrich each one of you as a person, that most beautiful of God's creation, and to add luminosity to your lives in a world that is often dark. Let us agree that we shall never forget one another. And whatever happens, remember how good it felt when we were all here together, united by a good and decent feeling, which made us better people, better probably than we would otherwise have been. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain forever. And may the Blessed Mother bless each one of you with her wonderful child, Jesus. Godspeed. tell my freshman self to just have faith. I mean, yes, we're lucky to be on a very faith-filled campus, but have faith in the sense that you're gonna, everything's going to be all right, and you just need to do the next best thing when you don't know what to do. I was involved in sports and music when I was younger. Uh, when I got to college, I knew that there wouldn't be very many opportunities to do sports and music after I graduated and I didn't take those opportunities and I wish I did. So I would tell my freshman self to get involved in more things that I already knew that I would like based on experiences in high school. Um, for example, it took me until this year to get involved with uh, some of the interhall sports like uh, interhall basketball. Be yourself, never compromise who you are and just keep going, explore your path, just do everything on your way. Go to more games, not just football games, I would say Spend more time on West Quad because it is the best quad. Just don't be scared. Have faith in yourself. Try all the new things. Do basketball earlier. Um, do everything you want to do and just do it with love and don't be scared because you're a light. I would just tell like my freshman year self to take it every moment because it goes by so fast. Even the little things that you think happen every day are going to be gone so soon. Something I started later in college that I would have wanted to start earlier is uh, joining like the soccer team and the basketball team for my dorm and getting more involved in my dorm uh, sports clubs. The advice that I give to my freshman self is to definitely just, if it seems even remotely interesting, to just try. And to not be afraid to reach out to anybody and not feel like you're being a burden or bothering anybody because the worst thing that happens is that a road ends and then a new one will open. The advice I would give my freshman self is to, to go to things alone and kind of not be nervous about showing up without anybody and kind of try the silly things even if it might be uncomfortable to begin with. To really take advantage of my opportunities here, not only academically but also with friends, 
and to kind of just cherish every moment because um, every moment is special um, and unique and you're not going to be here forever so definitely take advantage of every single opportunity that comes your way. To take classes on a whim just because, like at least one class that you haven't that it fits into nothing for your major, fits into nothing for any university requirement, just because you think it looks neat. Take that class. You know, maybe you'll drop it, but maybe you'll really like it and it'll totally change the trajectory of uh, your entire college career. Savor the relationships, um, form them, enjoy them. Like, there's so many great people at Notre Dame and um, it goes fast, so just enjoy every day. I think the advice that I would give to my freshman self is to go against the grain, to not like try to put myself into a little box and to recognize earlier, earlier on that my life is not just my resume. I would probably say to just get involved with more things off the bat. You get a lot of emails your freshman year and just go to every event you can and you'll find one that you like. Try to do work outside of my room because it really is a better opportunity to talk to other people that you go to class with. The advice that I would give my freshman year self is to trust your gut, um, honor your intuition. An aspect of life that I've learned here since my time in Notre Dame, you have to get ahead of your responsibilities because if they confront you, you won't really like the outcome. So the best thing that you can do is essentially get ahead rather than be behind. To really be present in every moment and put yourself out there and try to make as many friends as you can. Be more open and try new things. Um, that's something I've started to do this year as I'm trying to make the most of my senior year. And so often I'm finding myself saying things like, man, I wish I would have done this sooner. Notre Dame is really special in that all the opportunities that come your way are only here for four years, but if you make the most of them and really pursue everyone or everything that comes your way, um, you'll probably have a very meaningful, fruitful four years and meet a lot of great people. <laughs> My biggest thing is just to you know be involved. Um, make sure you're getting there, you're getting out there and doing things. Um, there's so much to do um, with the dorms and with the student events. I mean, the student clubs are great. Some advice I give my freshman year self would be to get involved in as many extracurricular activities as possible, whether that be on the educational side, such as SBC projects or dorm uh, athletics, you know, broom ball events, stuff like that. The friends that you make freshman year are truly going to be some of your lifelong friends. So value the friendships for sure. I think the thing I'm going to miss most about Notre Dame is uh, having all my friends just in the same area. Being able to like just go to someone's door and knock on their door and go hang out with them. I won't be able to do that in any other situation or scenario that I'm going to be in in the future. One thing I'll really miss about Notre Dame is dorm baths and like to, to celebrate the sacraments in a place of community um, and like have it available to you at every hour of the day all over campus is such a gift. I've met so many great people and it's going to be so sad leaving them but I'll know I'll have those friends for life. I feel like this is always the answer but just the people. Um, I just love being here. Um, it's a more diverse environment than where I was before, so the diversity of Notre Dame, all the different people, all the different experiences, and all the love um, that all those people have to share. So it's definitely going to be so like different, like not seeing all the familiar faces on campus every day, and like not being being able to like live with my friends all the time, and not being able to like see the grotto whenever I want or stuff like that. Just kind of missing like the overall people and just like also different places on campus that are like unlike anywhere else in the world. What I would miss most about my time here is just like all of the awesome friends that I've been able to make and the awesome opportunities that I've been able to have uh, giving back to the South Bend community and just really I think like there's no other place in the world like Notre Dame and that you're just around a lot of like-minded kids who are so committed to service. What I think I'll miss the most about Notre Dame is uh, just the opportunities that are here for anything and everything to experience new cultures, to experience new courses, meet new people from all over the country. When I first came to Notre Dame and heard I had to live in the dorm three out of the four years, it was, I was a little taken aback, but I wouldn't trade that for anything because it's a great way to, to build the camaraderie and those would be friends I'll have the rest of my life. To be able to like go to class but then also go to mass and all these other things that are offered on campus um, I think is really cool and I'm definitely going to miss that flexibility and all of those opportunities. I'm going to miss my friends the most. I'm going to miss them a lot. We're all kind of spreading out, which is really sad, but I'm really excited for everyone. I hope we stay in touch, but I'm definitely going to miss them the most. I think what makes Notre Dame different is that 
Um, we're all driven to do good in the world, and people really care about making the, a difference in the lives of others. What I'm gonna miss the most is my Saturday brunch that I would have with my friends after a night out. We just go over talking over everything that happened and everything that happened the week before. The Chick-fil-A that got put in Duncan Student Center um, during my junior year, a any other Chick-fil-A I've had, it has not been the same. I think the one in Duncan's just been that much better than any other one. Walking on campus with my friends, going to the dining hall, um, seeing all the laughs from everyone around me and just um, being surrounded by so many people I love and being in the place that I love. I'm really gonna miss a lot of the opportunities that I've had here to, I guess, do things that are kind of academic opportunities that are somewhat un unconventional. Study abroad is kind of an obvious one, but also I've, I've had the privilege of traveling to D.C. several times with the Nanavik Institute and also um, cultivate good relationships with a lot of faculty members and other students in that way. Orange and pink, blue skies, and uh, how picturesque the dome looks sitting on top of that. The thing I'll miss most about Notre Dame will be the weekend recaps uh, with all my friends, whether that be in the dining hall or uh, living off campus right now. Uh, you know, having a big uh, dinner with all my friends, recapping the fun things that we did um, outside of class was uh, one of my best memories at Notre Dame. The people, you know, you can walk up to anybody and really just sit down and have a conversation. And that's a new connection, that's a new person that you've met, that's a new relationship that you've, that you've grown essentially. My dorm walls had a share table, so there's always food there, study sacks to supplement. Um, that kind of culture and being able to be in that environment for three years at least um, is just truly something that you only get once and I think is very um, unique to Notre Dame. I'm going to miss definitely the spontaneity of social activities. When you're walking around campus, you're always greeted with smiling faces and great conversations, so that's definitely going to be something I'll miss. Football Saturdays are unbeatable. I mean, there's nothing like it. Going out there, all the camaraderie with your friends, meeting new people. I mean, that's where I've made some of my best friends at the football games. Um, you're out there, there's just no other vibe like it. actually went to the room, wanted to look at it first herself, and then once she looked at it, she came out yelling and screaming, I'm like, what's going on? And then she said, I got into Notre Dame, and we all just yelled, screamed, freaked out, <laughs> cried. It was just a beautiful moment. Montgomery attended Notre Dame football games. She went to her first game when she was probably eight years old, experiencing Notre Dame in the campus as a kid. She always aspired to go to Notre Dame and she worked real hard to get there. We expected Mike to be on the East Coast and he got into a lot of great schools and he still said, I really want to check this school out. So we trek out here, we pull into the gates of Notre Dame. Michael was like this little boy that just drove up envisioning the Disneyland castle. And he's taking selfies of himself in the big dome in the background. So that was it. We knew he was just like in love with Notre Dame at that moment and we knew he was going to be going here. He got the acceptance and we were all excited but we wanted to be careful not to assume he would definitely go there. He knew all along that if he got in he would go. So one day she, shook, she surprised me. She, saw, she told me crying that they accept me. I was so proud of her. From the very beginning, from the welcome weekend where all the kids were helping us move him in and get settled and meeting his RA and, and Father Paul being there, it, it was a massive welcome and a home away from home from day one. The way that the dorms experiences sort of substitutes for sororities and fraternities, I think was really good for her. Uh, she's been able to develop you know, relationships with uh, the girls, uh, young ladies in her dorm that I'm confident will be lifelong relationships. We have felt like people are watching out for each other a little more than you might expect at especially larger schools or public schools. The thing about Notre Dame that I have loved so much for him is that it's opened his world. You know, we're from South Bend and he's in school in South Bend, but it's provided him 
that opportunity to meet people from all over the place, to study abroad, uh, to just open his world in ways that we could have only dreamed of. It's not just the school and faculty, but the overall people that come out and, and get accepted to Notre Dame. They really have a genuine great love of, of people. And it's such a big majority when, when I felt it when I was there. I'm so, I'm so happy she went to this school. He's developed spiritually, intellectually, morally. He couldn't be happier uh, to be among uh, Notre Dame students and now graduates. Uh, I think the impact to her both, not just academically, but really just growing as, as a young woman has been profound. I don't think I would have guessed that to have been the case four years ago. And, and as I look back on it now, I'm, I'm thrilled at how she has grown over these years. As we come to commencement time, this has been an amazing journey. And at times at the very beginning, it seemed like it was forever, it was four years away. And it's so hard to believe that we are finally here. This is just unbelievable. It went by so fast. I brag all the time. <laughs> I brag all the time about her getting ready to graduate from Notre Dame. I mean, what, what is, there, is there to say? I mean, it's Notre Dame. Well, when he gets his diploma, my only hope is that I can keep it together. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're just so proud of him. And to see him walk across that stage, seeing him realize a dream, words are not gonna be able to describe it. I'm already started feeling very excited. I'm just like, I'm waiting for this day. One thing I want to tell her is like, I'm very proud of her. Well, I'm a crier, so um, the kids always make fun of me and assume I will cry at things like that, and I probably will. It's going to be a culmination of uh, climbing a, a mountain. We've gotten to experience Notre Dame sort of through her, you know, just a wonderful, uh, rewarding experience for our whole family. It's, it's going to be unbelievably emotional. One of life's great milestones as a parent to see your kid graduate from a place like Notre Dame. Sean and I both graduated from Notre Dame, but and, and John has been to campus many times with us uh, before he became a student, but, but now it's his Notre Dame. You know, he has his own experiences as a student and he's made lifelong friends and, and these lasting memories. But at Notre Dame, more than anything else, he's learned through these extraordinary experiences what it what it really means to be the fighting Irish.
get your bells, uh, you know, aim, oh aim God. out there. Remember, jump as long as Yeah, 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 that's fine. That's fine.
Ha, <laughs> This, the 178th commencement exercise for the University of Notre Dame, we, the chief marshals of the university, have assembled the graduates, degree candidates, and the faculty in academic procession. We now direct that the gates of the arena be opened for the academic procession of the class of 2023.
ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the degree candidates and the degree recipients of the University of Notre Dame. entering under the white banners are the graduates and degree candidates from the College of Arts and Letters. Since 2015, Arts and Letters has had five Rhodes Scholars, six Truman Scholars, and 143 Fulbright winners. The college is led by Sarah Mastillo, the IA O'Shaughnessy Dean and Professor of Sociology. The 2023 College of Arts and Letters class is composed of 90 PhDs, 308 masters, and 705 bachelor's degree students. Entering under the gold and yellow banner are so the graduates and degree candidates from the College of Science, led by Santiago Schnell, the William K. Warren Foundation Dean of the College and Professor of Biological Sciences. The college's accelerating research program expands our understanding of the universe while applying discovery to elevate the well-being of individuals and society. The 2023 College of Science class is composed of 93 PhD, 154 masters, and 467 bachelor's degree yeah. students.
Now entering under the light brown banners are the degree candidates and graduates from the Mendoza College of Business, led by Martin Kremers, the Martin J. Gillen Dean, and Bernard J. Hank, Professor of Finance. For the past decade, the college has been ranked as one of the leading undergraduate business schools in the nation. The 2023 Mendoza College of Business graduating class is comprised of 571 bachelors and 564 master's degree students.
Now entering under the orange banners are the graduates and degree candidates from the College of Engineering. Now celebrating 150 years of engineering at Notre Dame, the college is led by Patricia Culligan, the Matthew H. McCloskey Dean and Professor of Civil Engineering. From hypersonics to nanoelectronics, the College of Engineering is at the forefront of the engineering innovations that shape our modern world. The 2023 College of Engineering class is composed of 87 PhD, 81 masters, and 471 bachelor's degree students.
Now entering under the purple banners are the graduates of the law school, which was founded in 1869 and is the oldest Catholic law school in the nation. It's led by G. Marcus Cole, the Joseph A. Matson Dean and Professor of Law. The 2023 law school class is composed of 183 graduates who received their degrees yesterday. Now entering under the peacock blue banners are the graduates and degree candidates from the Keough School of Global Affairs. The Keough School, which prepares students to advance peace, human rights, and other dimensions of integral human development, is composed of nine international institutes and centers. The school admitted its first class of master's students in global affairs in August 2017, and is led by Scott Appleby, the Maryland Keough Dean and Professor of History. The 2023 Keough School class is composed of two PhD and 59 master's degree students. Now entering under the blue-violet banners are the graduates and degree candidates from the School of Architecture. The school was founded in 1898 and is led by Stefanos Palazoides, the Francis and Kathleen Rooney Dean and Professor of Architecture. Notre Dame was the first Catholic university in America to offer a degree in the field. The 2023 class is composed of 22 masters and 54 bachelor's degree students. Joining the undergraduates and processing at the end of each line are masters and PhD graduates from each college or school who received their degrees yesterday. 128 doctoral and 934 master students received their degrees and ceremonies in the Graduate School, the Keough School of Global Affairs, the Graduate Division of the Mendoza College of Business, and the Graduate Division of the School of Architecture. Now entering under the blue and gold banner are representatives of the Notre Dame faculty from each college and school.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise to greet our deans, honorees, chairman of the board of trustees, executive vice president, provost, university president, and other distinguished members of the commencement platform party, led by the university registrar.
Good morning. Good morning. Members of the class of 2023, your family and friends, trustees, President's Leadership Council, deans, faculty and staff, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my genuine pleasure to welcome you to the 178th commencement exercise in the 181st year in the life of the University of Notre Dame. We are delighted to see so many family and friends of our graduates here today. Today's ceremony is being simulcast live on the internet. Please remain standing for the singing of America the Beautiful, led by Reverend Kevin Grove, CSC. Father Grove. skies for amber waves of grain for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain America America God shed on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Thank you, Father Grove. Please be seated. We will begin our commencement exercises with an invocation, which will be delivered by this year's salutatorian. Miguel Costa is a student who is truly taking advantage of everything Notre Dame has to offer. He revved up roaring crowds right here in this stadium as a member of the cheer team. He majored in neuroscience and behavior in the College of Arts and Letters, study abroad in Dublin, and conducted undergraduate research at Notre Dame and MIT. For his academic excellence, leadership, and commitment to public service, Miguel won Phi Beta Kappa's prestigious Key into Public Service Scholarship in 2022. A Notre Dame Anne Bryce Scholar, Miguel is the first person from his family to attend college. And he has dedicated tremendous energy And he has dedicated tremendous energy to supporting and empowering fellow students, including serving as head mentor of the university's QuestBridge chapter, helping to establish the First Generation Careers Network, and serving as president of First GND, a club for first generation and low income students. Miguel is a talented photographer who can often be seen taking photos on campus. But his favorite subjects are his home and his beloved family, who have traveled here today from Tampa, Florida. I understand his six-year-old niece, Bella, has been eagerly counting down the days to this morning's ceremony. Miguel is a dedicated son, devoted brother, and favorite uncle, someone who keeps his family and his faith at the heart of everything he does. As one of his professors noted, his path is rooted in personal experience, deep intellectual exploration, and a commitment to a collective and hopeful future. After graduation, Miguel will join the healthcare software company Epic Systems, the first step in a career 
focused on protecting public health and addressing health care inequities. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the invocation by our salutatorian, Miguel Antonio Costa, Jr. As is our tradition at the University of Notre Dame, let us begin with prayer. Almighty God, full of boundless love, we thank you for allowing us to be here with our friends, families, classmates, professors, staff, and guests to celebrate all we've been given as we commence the next stage of our lives. We began our journey when we came to Our Lady's University with no clarity of the road ahead or where it would lead us. Yet, we stepped out in faith as our families entrusted us to this place. We could not have made here without them, our teachers, and mentors who guided us. Señor, te damos gracias por estas personas que se entregaron a sí mismas para asegurarse de que pudiéramos prosperar. The road has been long and difficult, but you have supported us at each step. In the darkest of nights, after hours of studying, after tears and pain, we found solace. We also found professors and mentors who shone the light for us in the darkness. We found dorm communities, classmates, and everlasting friendships. Our brothers and sisters who held our hands in the worst moments, who hugged us in the happiest moments, and who cherished us in the most vulnerable moments. We found your priestly servants and the staff of the university who listened to our cries, wiped our tears, and consoled us. We've also shared laughs, joy, and fellowship with these people. Thank you for all who have supported us along the way. Soon, we embark on a new journey, one beyond the Golden Dome. We thank you for those who will walk with us and continue to support us. May we be attentive to all who need a helping hand and give of ourselves united in Notre Dame, our mother. In your mercy, may we always do what is just, bring joy and light to the world, and hope in the cross. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Miguel. It is now my privilege to introduce this year's valedictorian, Kristen Friday of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a proud member of the Lewis Hall community. Kristen earned her degree from the College of Engineering, where she won the Steiner Award for Academic Excellence and Commitment to the Common Good. As one of her professors said, she is a visible role model of excellence, truly leading like a champion. Kristen majored in computer science and engineering, served as an undergraduate teaching assistant, studied abroad in London, and completed several internships, including with IBM and Microsoft. By all accounts, she was a stellar student, not because she was laser focused on her GPA, although that GPA was a perfect 4.0, but because she was genuinely fascinated by everything that she was learning. She not only gained knowledge, <coughs> She gained wisdom and insight into how, how to use her gifts in service to others. She co-founded the Notre Dame Women in Computer Science Club, which supports women in her field through computer panels, career mentorship, and community service outreach. As an ardent advocate for women in technology, she found it particularly meaningful to spend her senior year celebrating the 50th anniversary of co-education at Notre Dame and the 150th anniversary of the university's College of Engineering. 
After graduation, Kristen plans to work as a software engineer at Palantir Technologies. Her goal is to build innovative technological solutions that will empower users, promote the greater good, and improve the human experience. It is my honor and pleasure to present to you Kristen Helen Friday for the valedictory. Fellow graduates, friends, family, and esteemed guests, welcome to the University of Notre Dame Class of 2023 Commencement Ceremony. It is an honor and privilege to be given the opportunity to share a few words with you all and reminisce for a moment on our time as undergraduates. The months leading up to graduation have been a time of great nostalgia and reflection. While we have all grown in our knowledge and understanding since arriving at Notre Dame, there was a time in my life when I did not always have a strong voice. As a kid, I struggled to pronounce the letter R, which posed an issue for someone named Kristen Friday. <laughs> By the time I reached first grade, I was told to attend speech therapy. Once a week, I was singled out of regular classes and asked to read silly paragraphs aloud that were meaningless in content, but somehow important in improving my impediment. Initially, I was not phased at having to take this extra class. A few other students were in the same position, and I figured it was a normal growing pain some kids had to go through, similar to getting braces or learning long division for the first time. But then I noticed other students graduating in one, two, three years' time, yet I remained. I personally thought that I was making progress. However, this opinion was not affirmed externally. By the time I reached fifth grade, I had marginally improved. I was beginning to get to that point in my life of critical brain development, where my mind and personality were maturing at a rate a thousand times faster than my speech. Consequently, I was enrolled in an additional speech class outside of school. Despite attending multiple sessions a week, both in school and in my own personal time, I reached middle school to no avail. At this point, it was no longer a frustration, but an embarrassment. Every other student had graduated therapy classes, and I was the sole one left, struggling to enunciate the name of my homeroom teacher. The following year, my friends joked with me for mispronouncing a word as firmer during a presentation I delivered, of course not knowing how it affected me at the time. Eventually that year, I was told my speech was sufficient to leave the program. The announcement came with an overwhelming sense of joy, but also a deep sense of reservation. Was that all I needed? Other people's assurance that I was good enough? I kept practicing public speaking in high school, pushed myself to the limits as we all did, and applied to Notre Dame. Much to my disappointment, I was initially deferred. With swollen eyes and deferral letter in hand, I immediately went back to questions of, am I really good enough? Do outcomes define me? Am I going to let others decide my worth? Speech was just one flaw in my personal experience, but I wonder how many others have felt downtrodden by their imperfections. Having all eventually been accepted into Notre Dame, every one of us was challenged with living up to the expectations of entering a seemingly perfect environment where high school graduation speakers, captains of varsity sports teams, and leads in the musical became average. We were thrust into a whole new environment of intense academic stimulation devoted to pursuing our every intellectual curiosity. We were challenged to take classes for the sake of learning. We were encouraged not just to do assignments for the sake of completion, but rather for the pursuit of general knowledge and free inquiry. It was also an essential time of self-reflection, asking us to decide how our external environments were going to affect us 
and how we were going to influence the world. One such classmate sitting before me truly embodies this experience. Electrical engineering student John Sexton was personally affected by his dad's diagnosis with ALS. Rather than accepting his dad's limitations, John and his family took it upon themselves to develop a wheelchair controlled by eye movements, voice commands, and other features. John's idea has since transformed into this, to the startup named LifeDrive that will continue to empower those who have lost mobility in their power wheelchairs. John and the rest of the class of 2023 have been called to stand for the dedication, passion, and truth behind the Notre Dame mission, which aims to create a sense of human solidarity and concern for the common good that will bear fruit as learning becomes service to justice. Our education posed the opportunity for us to decide how we would look to define ourselves and how to present our skills to the world, and we did not take it for granted. For many of us, we defined ourselves with a global experience abroad, summers of service, or internships. One of our classmates, Christian McKernan, recognized the adversity his Ukrainian identity and community faced as a result of armed conflict and used his time as an undergraduate to provide support in Poland, aiding hundreds of thousands of refugees as they were displaced from their homes. Another such classmate, Quentin Hare, was compelled by country's lack of access to clean water in the developing world and ventured to a remote village in Fiji to research reliable sources of filtration. And many more engaged in real-life applications of learning, ranging from co-ops with Tesla to internships with the British Parliament. But whether that was the case for you or not, I believe it was a t an instrumental time of new perspective for all of us. These monumental experiences, while pivotal moments in our lives that we will look back on fondly, did not come without risks or uncertainty. It was perhaps the first time we lived on our own, or fended for ourselves as adults. Maybe it was the first time we were pushed beyond the scope of our perceived limitations, thus raising the bar for our maximum potential. We navigated new cities, language barriers, and unique cultural customs, all without many of the familiarities we have been accustomed to. In taking those risks and venturing into the unknown, we gained a sense of adventure and global perspective that has led to a more expansive view of the world. That being said, I am confident that not one of us took this journey alone. We as Notre Dame students have been encouraged by our peers, professors, mentors, family, and friends to be the best versions of ourselves. I witnessed fellow students going above and beyond to help one another, fostering an environment of collaboration over competition, and risking their own time and personal standing for others. The university itself aided our journey in recognizing the importance of an in-person community in the learning process, risking repercussions in the public eye, and furthering our understanding of what it means to be an academic with strong character. Few of us will remember the minute details of research papers or lab reports and assignments that warranted a Friday night in. Rather, what we will think back on is who we spent that time with and the attitude we carried as we sought out deeper relationships with our peers. Grounded by collaboration and compassion for others, we as a collective student body not only grew as resilient individuals, but also as members of a community much greater than ourselves. Notre Dame students epitomize the intersection of intellect and empathy, but not without risks. Though Notre Dame provided the resources and support to get us anywhere we wanted to go, 
It was ultimately up to us to decide what that direction would point to. To put it bluntly, Notre Dame was difficult. But our experience prepared us to understand that life is difficult and that accomplishing anything of value requires hard work. It is easy to look in hindsight and brush aside the challenges we faced, now knowing the outcome that we all indeed were able to make it to graduation. But dismissing the many long nights clocked studying for exams or the hours spent meticulously editing papers would be an injustice to the exponential growth and transformation we all endured. Some of us faced difficulties discerning which major to pursue. Some of us struggled to balance the time of a full Notre Dame course load on top of maintaining personal relationships, on top of interviewing for dozens of internships. Some of us may have even put in those hours of studying, contemplation, or job preparation only to fall short or be rejected again and again. In the end, though, it was those growing pains and times of frustration that served as catalysts for development. They taught us how to be inquisitive and seek help, as well as how to humble ourselves in the face of abstract and unknown problems. Those risks to invest time and fall short or to work through personal difficulties is what drives us as students towards the highest level of academic excellence and towards critical formation of character. Now looking back on how we have grown from our wide-eyed freshman selves, we realize how our limitations have stimulated our transformation and have developed our expertise in a multitude of ways. Having made it through four years of strenuous coursework, we are expected to be masters in our field of study. As teaching assistants, project leaders, and future professionals, we are now the ones fielding questions from the inquiring freshmen that we once were. Owning our expertise is precisely the risk we carry forward for the rest of our lives, and one that we must embrace head on. Even though we are young forces in the world, we have powerful voices and strong opinions that can help others in ways we may never imagine. While we certainly will still have questions going forward as lifelong learners, we should feel confident as Notre Dame graduates that we have grown to become self-assured, independent thinkers with a high degree of emotional intelligence, even with our weaknesses. Will we stumble more in the future? Most certainly. But our setbacks do not define us as people. I have come to realize that we all have our letter R. That is to say, aspects of ourselves that are imperfect. We all wonder if we are good enough. We all wonder and possibly fear how others will perceive us. We all come from challenges, obstacles, disadvantages, and hardships in our own way. But what are the benefits of those risks? We, as the class of 2023, are boldly moving on to become titans of industry with companies such as NASA, Microsoft, Boeing, and Goldman Sachs. Others as mavericks of art and architecture a select group of devoted men and women as officers of the United States military. Servants selflessly devoting a year of their lives to volunteer in the Peace Corps or teach with the Alliance for Catholic Education. Future doctors, lawyers, and professional engineers moving on to the most prestigious graduate programs in the world. And I myself, standing before you today in front of the largest audience of my life, humbled and honored to speak as a representative of this university. So let me leave you with this. 
we have been challenged the past four years to broaden our perspectives within the confines of Notre Dame. Now, we are tasked for the rest of our lives with using our skills for the greater good. We have learned the importance of risking failure, of seeking truth, and of taking leaps of faith, all for the purpose of being mindful, strong-willed, and contributing members of society. Only when we keep pushing and trusting in who we really are can we instill change. Even if the world says we stutter, even if admissions does not get it right the first time, <laughs> even if our jobs and surroundings punch us down, we each individually have infinite value, and there is a unique gift in all of us. As we learn to risk showcasing our authentic personality, weaknesses and all, we become a powerful force for good in society. The world will be a better place with our whole selves in it. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Your remarks are a powerful reminder that true leadership is not about perfection or presenting an image of perfection, but about authenticity. I have no doubt that you and your fellow graduates, whatever paths you follow in the years to come, will lead with wisdom, curiosity, and compassion. Congratulations, Kristen. I wish you all the best in your journey. We now proceed to the conferral of honorary degrees. The highest degree in the academy is the doctorate, a degree which designates that the recipient has completed a rigorous course of study, passed a stern set of examinations, and produced a major piece of scholarship. Fulfilling these requirements demonstrates that the individual has enormous potential to improve and enrich the world. Upon occasion, universities also award honorary doctoral degrees. As difficult as academic doctoral degrees are to earn, honorary doctoral degrees are even more difficult and require much more work, for honorary doctoral degrees are not awarded for just demonstrating the potential to improve the world, but rather for actually improving it. As such, when a university gives an honorary degree, is not giving an honor to someone, it is being honored by someone. It recognizes honor and virtue that already reside within the individual. Their presence honors us. Six such individuals have been selected to receive honorary degrees in this year's class. We will now confer the degrees. The University of Notre Dame confers the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa, on an engineer whose extraordinary gifts as a mentor and strategic planner have paved the way for over 3,000 students from underrepresented backgrounds to obtain advanced degrees in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The inaugural executive director of the National Consortium for Graduate Degrees for Minorities in Engineering, at that time housed here on Notre Dame's campus, his innate ability to make things happen and the extraordinary network he established of like-minded leaders in industry and academia have transformed lives and changed the landscape of higher education. Honored with a Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, Engineering, and Mentoring, and called on by President Reagan to lend his expertise on a U.S. Congressional Task Force focused on expanding access to women and other underrepresented groups, he has opened doors for generations of future scientists and engineers for the benefit of all humankind. For his tireless advocacy and unfailing commitment to developing the full potential of every individual on Howard Glenn Adams, Norfolk, Virginia.
The University of Notre Dame confers the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts, honoris causa, on an artist and songwriter beloved across genres and generations who has received countless awards for her innovative, boundary-breaking musical style, including six Grammys, 26 Dove Awards, and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Most recently recognized at the prestigious Kennedy Center Honors for a Lifetime of Artistic Achievement, she is the first Christian artist to be so honored. Beyond the stage and studio, she is a powerful force for good, working tirelessly to support, among many other philanthropic causes, St. Jude's Children's Hospital, Music Cares, Compassion International, and the Nashville Rescue Mission. Through her Helping Hands Foundation, she has opened the farm she shares with her family to various charitable organizations as an oasis for hope and healing. Widely admired for her positivity and faith-filled witness, she likes to say, my heroes are people who help other people. For using her extraordinary musical talent and public platform to make a difference in the world and thereby inspiring us to do the same, on Amy Grant, Nashville, Tennessee. The University of Notre Dame confers the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa, on a 1970 alumnus of Notre Dame who thought he would become a philosopher, only to find himself graduating from Harvard Medical School some 12 years later. What was to be a one-year stint serving the homeless before a prestigious oncology fellowship has led to a lifetime of service and solidarity with those most in need. Today, the president and founding physician of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program, an organization providing critical medical care for nearly 11,000 individuals each year. His compassion and tireless dedication to the rough sleepers speaks louder than words. He is a leader in shaping national policies on homelessness and housing, having established the country's first medical respite program for homeless individuals and serving as the national director of the National Fam Homeless Families Program for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. For the extraordinary ways, he answers daily the gospel call to love God and to love neighbor as ourselves on James Joseph O'Connell III, Boston, Massachusetts. The University of Notre Dame confers the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, on an alumnus who proudly followed in his beloved father's footsteps to attend Notre Dame, graduating in 1970, and embarking on what would become a legendary career in banking. Widely admired for his integrity and vision, he led PNC Financial Services Group to become one of the largest banks in the nation. Through his deep commitment to service, First evidence when he and his college roommate volunteered with the South Bend Agency serving the developmentally disabled, he has transformed the lives of many. He has done so through the creation of Grow Up Great, now a $500 million national early childhood learning initiative that prepares underserved children for school and life, as well as engagement with many philanthropic and educational initiatives in his adopted hometown of Pittsburgh, and through countless quiet acts of kindness and compassion. A loyal son of Notre Dame, his alma mater has been the fortunate beneficiary of his time, treasure, and talent, especially through his service as a university trustee for more than a decade. 
for the ways he embodies the spirit of Notre Dame as a humble, generous, and wise leader on James E. Rohr, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The University of Notre Dame confers the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa on a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, public servant, economist, and journalist who, as president of his native country of Colombia, was instrumental in establishing a path to long-term peace through the signing of Colombia's historic peace agreement after decades of war in the longest armed conflict in the Western Hemisphere. The recipient of many awards and accolades. He has devoted his life to seeking justice and peace for those most affected by the devastating impacts of war in his beloved homeland and in other parts of the world. Recognizing that caring for our planet is a prerequisite to building a world where all can flourish, he is a tireless advocate for an approach to peace building that sees environmental conservation as a critical priority. For his extraordinary courage, vision, and dedication to the cause of peace, on Juan Manuel Santos, Bogota, Colombia. The University of Notre Dame confers the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, on a loyal daughter of South Bend and beloved matriarch of the Northeast neighborhood who has dedicated her life to improving her hometown and building stronger communities so that all can flourish. Inspired by the example of her mother, Rinalda, after whom the Robinson Community Learning Center is named, she has been a tireless advocate for fostering connection and trust among neighbors, especially between the university and the greater South Bend community, through education, partnerships, and hospitality. Working for the Head Start program of St. Joseph County for many years to improve the lives of children, and then for the Robinson Community Learning Center, where she led programs for seniors, she brings light and hope wherever she goes. A woman of deep faith, with the courage of her convictions, her wise and candid insights and indomitable spirit make her a force to be reckoned with. For her unfailing devotion to this community and her commitment to building bridges on Marguerite Ann Taylor, South Bend, Indiana. Well, for our address, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome back to Notre Dame the Honorable, Honorable Juan Manuel Santos. The President of Colombia from 2010 to 2018, this courageous and visionary statesman, through an arduous peace process, the first phase of which culminated 
in the signing of the historic Colombian Peace Agreement on November 24, 2016. The accord is celebrated as a major turning point in the country's 52-year-long armed conflict. President Santos, in 2016, was the sole recipient of the Nobel Prize for his pivotal role in ending the longest war in the Western Hemisphere. His speech to the Nobel Committee in Oslo City Hall on December 10th of that year, delivered only two weeks after the final agreement was signed and one week after the Colombian Congress overwhelmingly ratified it, was eloquent and wise. It is much harder to make peace than to wage war, he said, reminding his office uh, that the efforts to find peace through dialogue began 34 years earlier and included multiple setbacks. Yet, he said, quote, a final victory through force when nonviolent alternatives exist is none other than the defeat of the human spirit. When at all possible, we must pursue dialogue based on respect for the dignity of all. In his Nobel Prize speech, President Santos acknowledged the work of the scholars of the Kroc Institute here at Notre Dame. We are proud and humbled that the peace agreement gives the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Peace Institute primary responsibility for technical verification and monitoring of the implementation of the accord. While President Santos has received many other recognitions for his work to promote peace, it's worth noting that he has been recognized for his pioneering environmental policies to protect his country's biodiversity and fight climate change. He was awarded the Royal Botanic Gardens Q International Medal and the Wildlife Conservation Society Theodore Roosevelt Award for conservation leadership and was honored by the National Geographic Society for his unwavering commitment to conservation. President Santos, with graduate gratitude for your persistence and successful efforts to launch a peace process that stands as a beacon of hope to a world engulfed in deadly conflict, Notre Dame is proud to welcome you as our commencement speaker. President Santos. Dear Reverend Jenkins and members of the Board of Trustees, distinguished members of the faculty, honored alumni, students, family members, friends, and most importantly, dear students of the Notre Dame class of 2023. What a joy and what an honor to be with you today to celebrate the graduation of a new generation of young people ready to build a better world. To all of you members of the class of 2023, congratulations. Personally, I have many reasons to be grateful to this prestigious university with more than 100 and 80 years of history. First, your well-known Kroc Institute for International Peace, whose head is my compatriot, Josefina Chavarria, has been and continues to be a fundamental ally in the process of not only making peace, but also building peace in my country, Colombia. As many of you might know, during my term as president, I worked to achieve peace with the oldest and most powerful guerrilla group in the Western Hemisphere, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, known as the FARC. It was not an easy task. Making peace never is. In fact, making peace is much more difficult than making war. And I know this because I have made both. For six years,
from 2010 to 2016, we held very difficult negotiations until we were able to sign a peace agreement that put an end to the oldest armed conflict in the Americas and transformed this guerrilla group into a political party. That is the goal of any peace process, to turn from weapons to words, from bullets to ballots, and from violence to freedom and democracy. The Kroc Institute is helping to monitor the agreements, its effects, and its implementation. And it's not an easy job, because according to its own assessment, it is the most ambitious and comprehensive peace agreement ever signed. Quite true, it is the first peace agreement to include an ethnic chapter and also a gender chapter. It is the first to put the rights of the victims at the center of the negotiations. And it is the first to include a special transitional justice system in accordance to the Rome Statute. I am proud to say that the Colombian Peace Agreement is a model for many nations and conti that continue to suffer from the effects of conflict and war. And today, I come to the University of Notre Dame to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your contribution to peace in Colombia. And allow me to give you a first piece of advice for your lives, for your future. No matter where you are, what you are working on, be peacemakers. Whatever it takes, at all times, for the sake of this world, become peacemakers. To become a true peacemaker, first, you must make, you must be at peace with yourself, at peace with your own conscience. So here is my second piece of advice. Whenever you have to choose be between being at peace or proving yourself right, choose the way of peace. We have, we have too many wars, conflicts, deaths, victims, and violence because human beings insist that only they, not their fellow humans, know the correct course of action. It is better to be at peace than to prove to anyone that you are right. Work with peace in your heart. Find peace in your soul, and everything else will follow. I am also grateful to this university because last year I had the privilege of becoming a fellow and a visiting professor here at the Keough School of Global Affairs. Thank you. Dean Appleby. This, this gave me 
the wonderful opportunity to interact with students, faculty, and the staff on this beautiful campus. And perhaps, just perhaps, I was able to bring a bit of luck to your flagship team, the beloved Fighting Irish. When I came here last year, the Irish were going through a rough patch, having lost the two previous football games. In one of the lectures I gave as a visiting professor, I said that 52 years ago, when I was a student at the University of Kansas, I was invited to the Super Bowl in Kansas City when, for the first time ever, the Chiefs became champions. And by pure coincidence, 50 years later, in 2020, I was in Miami, and I was again invited to the Super Bowl. The Chiefs won their second championship. By, by the way, this year, they won again. With these credentials, I then had the audacity to say that maybe I could bring some luck to the fighting Irish. I was, I was, of course, invited to the game the following Saturday, September the 17th. And in this very same stadium, I had the joy of witnessing the fighting Irish beat California in a Nile biting match. The excitement was so contagious that I almost ran over to the student section for some touchdown push-ups. <laughs> and after that, the Fighting Irish went on a winning streak that placed them back in its historic position of excellence. I don't know if I brought luck to the Fighting Irish last year, but I can assure you, dear members of the class of 2023, I will be wishing you all the luck in the world as you leave this wonderful university today. So go Irish, go class of 2023. Dear friends and students, moving on a different subject, let's talk about today's existential threats. I have the honor of being part of the Elders, an organization founded by Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu to bring together world leaders working for peace, human rights, and climate justice. As an elder, I was invited earlier this year to Washington, D.C. to witness the unveiling of the so-called Doomsday Clock. Back in 1945, Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer and the scientists at the University of Chicago who had helped develop the first atomic weapon for the Manhattan Project, founding, founded the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist to monitor this formidable but horrific development. Two years later, they launched the Doomsday Clock, a powerful symbol to represent the urgency of acting to avoid humanity's extinction. Every year since, the clock points out how close we are to midnight in the history of the world, meaning how close we are to bringing about 
our own apocalypse. In the beginning, the clock was set at seven minutes to midnight, mainly because of the nuclear threat. It has changed 27 times. This year, this year, after evaluating Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the increase in the nuclear arsenal around the world, the climate crisis we are all now already suffering, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the threats brought by biosecurity and disruptive technologies, the bulletin of the atomic scientist reset the clock hands from 100 to 90 seconds, the closest it has ever been to midnight. We must, therefore, realize that we are living at a decisive time in which we must act all swiftly and responsibly. You face, we face, immense challenges ahead, as humanity always has. There are country, countless conflicts are across the planet, not only the war on Ukraine, but also the wars in Asia and Africa. Today, we have more than 100 conflicts, often overshadowed by the war in Europe, but no less serious, such as the one in Ethiopia and Sudan. World leaders like Raven Madman continue to bare their teeth at each other, and some even threaten to use nuclear weapons that we thought were far, far from our reality. Countries that were characterized by an anti-war culture are beginning to rearm to contain this threat and the funds that should go to fix social problems or create prosperity are once again financing an arms race. Climate change has gone from being a sensible warning from a, new, a few scientists to a real existential emergency that threatens the survival of our planet and our kind. It is sad, sad to see how, despite the world meetings held and the speeches made, the most powerful nations refuse to, to take concrete, measurable actions that protect the air and the water we all need to survive. And now, we have a new existential threat straight out of science fiction. Many experts are warning us about artificial intelligence and its real dangers to humankind. Many scientists have even asked for a moratorium in its development, cautioning us that we must first learn to master AI before it masters us. This threat is so real that one of the godfathers of AI resigned from Google recently because the tech giants, with their uncontrolled competition, are creating a monster that might very well devour us. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists saw this coming. They had included disruptive technologies as an existential threat four years ago. Of course, AI, like all technological breakthroughs, can be harmful, harmful or can be beneficial. It depends entirely on us 
and on our wisdom in using it. The end of the world might seem closer than ever. So is it time to despair? Should we abandon hope? No. By all means, no. Humanity has overcome existential crises in its hundreds of thousands of years on Earth. And I am certain, certain that we will be able to over overcome the current ones. Why? Because I am convinced that you are a generation of young people who have prepared yourselves to serve not only your country, but the planet. Not only your people, but all people. Like I said in my Nobel lecture in December 2016, when progress is based on exclusion, it is fragile and will ultimately disappear. However, when progress is based on inclusion, when we understand that everyone's life is as valuable as our own, then that progress is lasting and real. If we understand this, if we work together and are convinced that what happens to one happens to all the rest, we will one day see the hands of the doomsday clock move backward. Because the present, not just the future, belongs to you. Act with love, always with love, the greatest force in the universe. Act responsibly and with empathy. Be aware of the privilege of your education and return to the world the gifts you have received and act with moderation, as your founding father, George Washington, recommended in his celebrated farewell address. Remembering, as he urged us to cultivate peace and harmony with all. Be compassionate, be tolerant, and be simply good people because out of compassion, tolerance, and kindness, a better world will be born. I am grateful for the immense honor of being conferred an honorary degree in this great university. Today, like you, dear colleagues at the University of Notre Dame, I wear the colors and insignia of this campus. Let's raise our arms like touchdown Jesus and say, say it once again with all our enthusiasm. Go Irish, play like a champion. Go class of 2023. Congratulations and many thanks. Thank you, President Santos, your inspiring call to become peacemakers and your confidence in our capacity to do so will remain with all of us in the months and years ahead. We are grateful that you join Notre Dame as a visiting faculty member, presidential peacemaker, and all around football good luck charm. <laughs> Again, thank you for doing this important work and for your inspirational words. Just as you graduates will soon begin a new life outside the university, so too will several members of the faculty who enter emeritus status 
from Notre Dame with the close of this academic year. Each has served the university in countless numbers of students with distinction and commitment. You can find the full list on page 78 of the program. It is my privilege to recognize those emeriti faculty in attendance today. I ask each emeritus faculty member to rise and turn toward the students when I call your name. Please remain standing until all have been recognized. Please hold your applause until all the names have been called. Stephen Fallon, Professor Emeritus, Program of Liberal Studies. Davi Day Hill, Professor Emeritus, Chemical and Biomecular Engineering. Joshua B. Kaplan, Teaching Professor Emeritus, Political Science. J. Parker Ladwig, Librarian Emeritus, Hesburg Library. And Ken Sauer, Professor Emeritus, Electrical Engineering. Please join me in recognizing these faculty members for their many years of contributions to Notre Dame. <clears throat> On behalf of the university, I now have the honor of recognizing faculty members for their excellence in teaching and advising. Their names are listed on pages 85 to 87 of the commencement program. Earlier today, the photos of the award winners were shown on the video boards. <clears throat> I ask all faculty receiving awards for their teaching and advising to please rise now. Please join me in giving these extraordinary teachers a round of applause. <laughs> Class of 2023, it is right to recognize your other teachers as well. Next year, families, you may more owe more to your faculty and rectors for your degree and for your formation than any other single group of people. Without them, the knowledge you acquired would have come without insight or wisdom. In the future, when you look back at the time you spent studying here, it's not the facts you'll remember, but the people. I ask all the faculty and rectors to rise, and I ask the class of 2023, and all of us as well, to give them one final ovation. Although all graduates here today have earned the ultimate honor, their degree, many of our students have also won special awards and prizes. These students are listed on pages 78 and 87 to 104 of the commencement booklet. I ask all of you who have received awards and prizes, undergraduate, graduate, and professional students, to please now stand and be recognized. Would you join me in congratulating these students? Next, I ask you to join me in congratulating those students who are graduating with Latin honors. With those students, graduating summa cum laude, that is, they are in the top 5% of their college's class, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> With those students graduating magna cum laude, that is, they are in the top 15% of their college's class, please stand and be recognized.
And with those students graduating cum laude, who are in the top 30% of their college's class, please stand and be recognized. It is now my pleasure to call on the chair of Notre Dame's Board of Trustees, Mr. John J. Brennan, for the introduction of our Laetari Medal winner. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Provost McGreevy. Sister, as the daughter of Irish immigrants, you were taught the value of hard work, education, a loving home, and gratitude for God's many gifts. At the age of 19, you dedicated your life to God and to serving those most in need by joining the Sisters of Mercy, and you began teaching in Chicago's archdiocesan schools while continuing your own education. When you were called to lead Misericordia Home on Chicago's South Side in 1969, you found that its young residents were well cared for, but given few opportunities to grow and develop their abilities. It was your forward thinking and compassionate leadership that provided children with developmental disabilities the education and recreational opportunities necessary to reach their full potential and to live the lives they deserve. Through your vision, abiding faith, and selfless service for more than 50 years, Misericordia has grown into a thriving 37-acre community that now serves more than 600 children and adult residents and offers a wide range of vocational, educational, and therapy programs in a loving and nurturing environment. Along the way, you have been a source of hope and comfort for thousands of society's most vulnerable people and those who care for them. You have said of your residents that, quote, each one is a unique gift to us today, a loving and loved person made by God with a purpose no matter how wrapped in mystery that purpose may be. Indeed, it is clear that you have also been placed in their lives as a gift from God, and that with his guidance, you have helped them to discern that purpose. In so doing, you have changed the lives of every person who has encountered misericordia and created a new standard of compassionate care. For your loving and determined advocacy on behalf of children and adults with disabilities, for your lifelong commitment to showing the merciful face of Christ to the world, and for your inspirational example at the helm and heart of Misericordia, the University of Notre Dame rejoices to confer upon you its highest honor, the Laetari Medal. On Sister Rosemary Connolly, RSM, Chicago, Illinois. Good morning. Congratulations to you graduates, parents, and most dedicated faculty on this wonderful accomplishment you've achieved in being here today at the 2023 commencement ceremony. I hope you're able to take a moment to feel the pride you so richly deserve. The world is sure, is sure to be a better place because of your diligence and commitment in making it to this day. I'm truly honored to have been invited to join you and to accept this prestigious award. Receiving the Leitari Medal and becoming a part of its history is not something I could ever imagine. When I look at the list of previous recipients I'm very humbled to be included in such an outstanding group. I was born on the west side of Chicago to Irish immigrants 
who prayed and dreamed of a better life for themselves and their children. My mother and father traveled thousands of miles across the Atlantic Ocean to achieve their goal. We were raised to work and study hard, to love and honor God our Father in every aspect of our lives. We were raised to always be grateful for God's many gifts. My parents came to America for a better life, and they never let us forget or take for granted the wonders of being born in this country. If they were still with us today, being honored by the University of Notre Dame would bring them such joy, as Notre Dame means so much to our Irish community. I was 18 when I told my mother I wanted to become a Sister of Mercy. At 19, she and my father allowed me to join the community. The Sisters of Mercy are an Irish religious order founded by Mother Catherine McCauley. Our lives as Sisters of Mercy are focused on responding to unmet needs through direct service and by seeking ways to change unjust systems. I joined this religious community thinking I would live a nice, quiet, contemplative life, but soon learned that God had other plans for me. My life has never been quiet, and to this day, even as I slow down, I am still quite busy. God has been with me every step of the way. I was always given the right people at the right time, and in step with my religious vows, we always set forth to meet unmet needs for God's most vulnerable people. We dreamt of creating a home with a full continuum of care for our residents, a place where living arrangements and programs could evolve as their needs changed. We put our faith in God, and those hopes and dreams came to life. Today, Misericordia cares for more than 600 children and adults. Thankfully, God continues to send good and generous people who believe in our mission, enough to help us achieve our goals. I humbly accept the Leitari Medal on behalf of all those who brought me to this moment. In honoring me with the Leitari Medal, you honor our community of children and adults with developmental disabilities and their families who deserve no less than the best care possible. You help fulfill their prayer and dream of a beautiful life and a bright future worth living for their family. Please know I will spend the rest of my life trying to honor you in gratitude for your acknowledgement of the special role children and adults of Misericordia and others with intellectual and developmental disabilities hold in our world. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Conley, for your ambitious vision, your compassionate leadership, and your caring commitment. You honor us by your presence here and inspire us to do more. Thank you again. <laughs> Yesterday, degrees were awarded by the Graduate School, the Graduate Division of the Mendoza College of Business, the Law School, and the Keogh School of Global Affairs. So that we too may congratulate these graduates, will those of you who received your degree in one of these ceremonies please rise.
The dean of each college and school awarding baccalaureate degrees will now formally present to the university's president, Father John Jenkins, the candidates for their degrees. I ask that each dean in turn, beginning with Dean Sarah Mastillo of the College of Arts and Letters, please come forward to present the candidates for baccalaureate degrees. Will the candidates for the bachelor degree in the College of Arts and Letters and the faculty of the College of Arts and Letters please rise. <laughs> Reverend Father President, I am pleased to present to you the candidates who have completed the requirements for the bachelor degree in the College of Arts and Letters. As Dean of the College and in the name of the faculty of the college, I now ask that you confer upon these students the degree which they have earned. Thank you, Dean Mastillo. By the authority vested in me as President of the University of Notre Dame du Lac and in the name of the trustees of the university and the faculty of the College of Arts and Letters, I solemnly and publicly confer on you the degree recommended by your Dean. We admit you to all its rights and privileges and remind you of the responsibilities you are about to assume. May God bless and keep you. Congratulations. Will the candidates for the bachelor degree in the College of Science and the faculty of the College of Science please rise. <laughs> Reverend Father President, I'm pleased to present to you the candidates who have completed the requirements for the bachelor degree in the College of Science. As the Dean of the College, and in the name of the faculty of the college, I now ask that you confer upon these students the degree they have earned. Thank you, Dean Schnell. By the authority vested in me as president of the University of Notre Dame du Lac, and in the name of the trustees of the university, and the faculty of the College of Science, I solemnly and publicly confer on you the degree recommended by your dean. We admit you to all its rights and privileges and remind you of the responsibilities you are about to assume. May God bless and keep you. Congratulations. Will the candidates for the bachelor degree in the College of Engineering and the faculty of the College of Engineering please rise? <laughs> Reverend Father President, I am pleased to present to you the candidates who have completed the requirements for the bachelor degree in the College of Engineering. As Dean of the College, and in the name of the faculty of the college, I now ask that you confer upon these students the degree that they have earned. Thank you, Dean Culligan. By the authority vested in me as president of the University of Notre Dame du Lac and in the name of the trustees of the university and the faculty of the College of Engineering, I solemnly and publicly confer on you the degree recommended by your dean. We admit you to all its rights and privileges and remind you of the responsibilities you are about to assume. May God bless and keep you. Congratulations.
Will the candidates for the bachelor degree in the Mendoza College of Business and the faculty of the Mendoza College of Business please rise. <laughs> Reverend Father President, I am pleased to present to you the candidates who have completed the requirements for the bachelor degree in the Mendoza College of Business. As Dean of the College, and in the name of the faculty of the college, I now ask that you confer upon these students the degree which they have earned. Thank you, Dean Kremers. By the authority vested in me as president of the University of Notre Dame du Lac and in the name of the trustees of the university and the faculty of the Mendoza College of Business, I solemnly and publicly confer on you the degree recommended by your dean. We admit you to all its rights and privileges and remind you of the responsibilities you are about to assume. May God bless and keep you. Congratulations. Will the candidates for the bachelor degree in the School of Architecture and the faculty of the School of Architecture please rise. <laughs> Reverend Father President, I am pleased to present to you the candidates who have completed the requirements for the bachelor degree in the School of Architecture. As Associate Dean of the School and in the name of the faculty of the school, I now ask that you confer upon these students the degree which they have earned. Thank you, Dean Yunez. By the authority vested in me as president of the University of Notre Dame du Lac, and in the name of the trustees of the university and the faculty of the School of Architecture, I solemnly and publicly confer on you the degree recommended by your dean. We admit you to all its rights and privileges and remind you of the responsibilities you are about to assume. May God bless and keep you. Congratulations. You know, graduates, we have recognized so many deserving people, but we have not yet recognized a group that is perhaps most deserving. Graduates, you would not be here were it not for the support, care, and love of your parents, guardians, and families. They have many, many times cheered for you we need to recognize them. So graduates, I ask you to stand, turn, and applaud those without whom you would not be here, your parents and families and those who are waiting for you. charge with this. Take what you have learned here at the University of Notre Dame and let it enable you to go forth and do good. Always be as generous as you can with your time, talent, 
and all you have. In your family life, your professional life, in your spiritual life, every day of your life, never forget that the charge for you as Notre Dame graduates is to be a force for good in this world. As President Santos reminded us, find peace in yourselves that you can be peacemakers in this world. Keep alive the friendships you have formed here at Notre Dame, for they will provide joy, strength, and comfort in the years ahead. They will be among the great treasures of your life. Class of 2023, you will always have a special place in my heart because we have been through together a global pandemic here at Notre Dame. As I often say, one of my true joys as president is to meet alumni of the University of Notre Dame all around the world and hear of their remarkable accomplishments and their dedicated service. That will certainly be true for you, members of the class of 2023. I look forward to the time, years hence, when I will meet you and feel proud that you are graduates of the University of Notre Dame. I am sure there will be challenges, frustrations, disappointments, and detours in your lives. Know that you will always be in our prayers here at Notre Dame. And wherever you go, and whatever happens in your life, you will always have a home at Notre Dame to renew your heart and refresh your spirit. God bless you all. Before we conclude today, I would like to acknowledge three superb university leaders who are stepping down from their positions at the end of this academic year. I offer my thanks to Thomas Fuge, Interim Vice President, Associate Provost, and Dean of the Graduate School. Elliot Visconti, Associate Provost and Chief Academic Digital Officer. And Robert Bernhard, Vice President for Research. Please join me in congratulating them on their dedicated service. Would you also please join me in giving our musicians a well-deserved round of applause. We now come to the conclusion of the 178th commencement of the University of Notre Dame. Class of 2023, I join Father Jenkins in extending to you, on behalf of my colleagues on the board, on the faculty, and on the staff, the best wishes of your alma mater now and for all the days of your life. As we conclude, the platform party and the faculty will recess from the stadium. We ask that all graduates and guests please remain seated until the platform party and faculty have left the stadium. Graduates, as you exit the stadium tunnel, please keep walking toward the library mall so that those following you have room to exit. Once again, class of 2023, congratulations. Our commencement exercises now draw to a close and I invite Father Jenkins back to the podium for the benediction. Father Jenkins. Okay, I'm gonna ask for some help with this closing prayer from one of our honorees, Amy Grant, and her colleague, Jason Webb, who will accompany her on the keyboard. Amy will sing for us, Breath of Heaven, a prayerful meditation on the life of Mary, Our Lady, and, and Mary's response to God's call in her life. 
it's appropriate as you graduates begin your journeys after graduation in the world. So first, let us join in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of learning and discovery, for the knowledge and understand and for the knowledge and understanding they engender. We at Notre Dame are dedicated to cultivating these gifts. We thank you for our graduates, the class of 2023 who have learned and grown here at Notre Dame and the privilege we have had of walking with them. We thank you for the parents, guardians, spouses, and families of these graduates and for the love and support they have given to bring our students to this day. We ask for your special guidance and protection for these graduates as they go forth and use what they have learned at Notre Dame to heal enlighten and unify a world deeply in need. And we ask Notre Dame Our Lady to walk with and intercede for these graduates on their journeys so that in the words of her prayer, their souls may magnify the Lord and their spirit may rejoice in God. We pray this in your name, amen. <laughs>
today, our mother, tender, strong, and true, proudly in the heavens gleams thy gold and blue. Glory's mantle cloaks thee, golden is thy fame. And our hearts
Thank you.